Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to Letterform Lectures, online edition. My name is Gwendol, and I'm Education Director at Letterform Archive. And once again, we have an international audience today. So please type in where you're coming from in the chat. And a reminder that if you do have questions for our speaker, and we hope you do, please put them in the Q&A. I want to first give a big shout out to Skilla Zaccolini. She is the brains and the brawn behind this lecture series. Thank you, Skilla. OK. Letterform Archive is the home of Type West. Oopsie daisy. Hang on one sec. Let's talk Letterform Archive, the home of Type West, which is our school of type design. And we have a slew of great lectures and public workshops coming up for you this year. And I'll tell you about a few of them in just a second. But first of all, our students have graduated. Um, I'm proud to announce that the Type West Postgraduate Certificate Program in Type Design Class of 2022 did it. And if you missed the formal ceremony, no worries. It'll soon be up on our Vimeo channel. And uh, Skilla is going to drop a link to the website in the chat for you, but here it is, uh, typewest.letterformarchive.org um, slash 2022. So check out those typefaces now and look for that Vimeo link if you wanna watch the graduation. Okay, here's some events coming up that we'd like to tell you about. Um, next week is a busy week for us. On Tuesday, get ready to explore the visual power of a lost calligraphic tradition with Jumana Medledj as she leads us on a journey through early Arabic scripts that are broadly labeled as Kufic. And then we have on Thursday, a special letterform lecture um, in which we are hosting Stephen Heller. He will be interviewed on his early years as a graphic designer in counterculture New York by the CCA MFA Design Program Chair, John Sueda, who also happens to be the Associate Curator of Exhibitions at Letterform Archive. This should be a wild ride. Do not miss it. So for more information on upcoming Letterform lectures and our salon series and workshops and events, go to letter, letarc.org slash events. Better yet, help keep great lectures like today's going, go to letarc.org slash join and become a member of Letterform Archive today. Last but not least, be sure to follow us on Instagram to stay on top of our upcoming events and programs. Skill is dropping those links in the chat too. All right. Welcome to Letterform Lectures 2023. Letterform Lectures are co-presented by Letterform Archive and SFPL Book Arts and Special Collections. Letterform Archive is a nonprofit institution housing over 100,000 works of graphic design history. That's a lot. And we'd like to thank Adobe for generously sponsoring the video recording of this lecture series. You can view all Letterform lectures online soon after they happen. Just go to our website. OK, we are honored to welcome our speaker today, Cherokee Nation citizen Chris Skillern, who's also a graduate of the Type West program. Chris Skillern will walk us through the history of the Cherokee syllabary and the current state of Cherokee type design today. So Chris told us a sweet story about his young daughter who has been studying Cherokee. And apparently she is very excited to be learning the syllabary and is even teaching her classmates a few things. So um, Chris named her his first font after her too, which is so sweet. Okay, without further ado, we welcome Chris Gillard. Take it away, Chris. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I was muted. Um, thank you all so much for being here today. Uh, I'm in a little bit of a scramble right here, just trying to get my slides up on the screen. But let me get that pulled up for you real quick. 
and then I will get started. Okay. So sorry, it's been a little bit of a hectic day. All right. So um, here we go, share screen. Looking good. Are we good? The full screen now? Yep. <laughs> All right. I did it. Let's get the show on the road. Okay. Um, Siona God, uh, Chris Nagado, Jalagi, Talasi uh, Janela. Hi, everybody. I'm Chris Skillern. I'm a type designer and a citizen of the Cherokee Nation from Tulsa, Oklahoma, which is on the present day lands of the Muscogee, Cherokee, and Osage Nations. I live here with my wife and my daughter who's in second grade and who is right at this moment competing in her district-wide chess tournament after finishing top eight in her school. And I just had to give her a little shout out because I'm so proud of her. She's, um, I think the last I heard, she's three for five out of eight rounds so far. So I'm pretty proud. I don't even know how to play chess. She's much smarter than I am. Um, so I'm Chris Skillern. Um, a little bit about me. I started my art journey as a kid drawing cartoons, which I still do for fun. And my aesthetic is very much informed by that. It's, uh, bright colors, <clears throat> lively letters, friendliness, that sort of thing. Um, I studied graphic design in college. It was actually my minor, my degrees in journalism, because somehow that seemed more practical to me at the time in 2005, looking back at uh, clearly it was not practical. So I, I pretty quickly switched to graphic design as a career. I've been obsessed with type for about 15 years or so now. Um, I run a small type foundry called Tulsi Type that hasn't actually released anything yet, but I'm working toward doing so in the very near future. Today, I wanna to talk about the Cherokee language and more specifically the syllabary, which is our writing system. Sequoia, the inventor of the syllabary referred to written language as talking leaves, hence the name of my talk, New Leaves. So um, first, some background about myself. This whole talk won't be about me, but um, I think it's important to let you know where I'm coming from. And for me, personal connection is everything. So uh, I didn't grow up being exposed to Cherokee culture, really. Um, being Cherokee is one thing that I've always known about my background. My parents made sure that my brothers and I were enrolled citizens early in our lives. Uh, I learned a few simple Cherokee words growing up, but that was about the extent of it. You can chalk it up to growing up in the city instead of a community with more speakers, uh, chalk it up to assimilation. That's just what I knew, but I always had a desire to know more. So I come from two Cherokee lines, my grandpa's family on my mom's side and my grandma's family on my dad's side. My grandpa, Ken Carey, everybody called him babe, <clears throat> just passed away excuse me, uh, just passed away in July at 95 years old. Uh, he was the best. He had just the quickest wit of anyone you'll ever meet. He taught my brother and I our first chords on guitar and unwittingly started, off, started us off on our 20 plus year punk and indie rock career. Um, he and my grandma and my mom used to sing gospel music on the radio as the singing carries. He was from Holbert, Oklahoma. And we made a lot of trips with my grandparents to Holbert and nearby 14 Mile Creek as kids. Grandpa's dad spoke Cherokee fluently <clears throat> and would sometimes act as a translator, but he told my grandpa that he didn't need to know the language because we're living in a white man's world. Um, <clears throat> grandpa told us lots of stories of being an ornery kid in Holbert and growing up around relatives he couldn't understand because they spoke Cherokee and he didn't. Uh, my grandma, Ella, was from Proctor, Oklahoma. She passed away in, I'm sorry, I'm getting so choked up today. She passed away in November of 2019. 
at 96. And she was amazing too. She was a pediatric nurse and worked at the hospital where I was born. As far as I know, her immediate family didn't really speak the language and her high school was Haskell in Kansas, which started its life as a boarding school where of course the students weren't allowed to speak their native languages. Um, She was very proud to be Cherokee though and she collected lots of Cherokee and native art, um, which I'm blessed to be able to have some of some of her pieces that she collected in our house now. Um, And she wanted Amazing Grace and Cherokee played at her funeral, which is exactly what we did. Um, Later, when I started to try to learn the language, she gave me a couple of little language booklets that she had used to practice. And I go back to these often. Um, They, you know, they remind me of her and they also have uh, some fun words in them and also this nice little handwriting, which I can reference when I'm, Drawing, uh, designing Cherokee type. So uh, connecting to culture and connecting to language always felt not exactly unattainable to me. I mean, I'm in northeastern Oklahoma, but it was difficult to find an entry point until I got into type design. And I started wondering about syllabary fonts. Um, I started wondering if this was something I could contribute. I just so happened, uh, just so happened that around that time in the early 2010s, Roy Boney, who's a Cherokee artist and a manager of the Cherokee language program, and Joseph Erb, another Cherokee artist, had just given a talk at TypeCon, and there was a little bit of conversation around that topic, and it made me feel like maybe there was something there. So I started digging in and doing research about the syllabary, and I started looking for what was out, what else was out there font-wise for the syllabary. Spoiler alert, not very much. For reference, this is more or less what's out there now, give or take a couple. I know there's there are some that I don't have on here, um, but I don't have a license for them. So there's maybe a couple more that are, are um, usable, but still not a lot. Um, I especially noticed the lack of Cherokee fonts from Cherokee designers, which is still the case. Uh, So there wasn't a lot to work from, aside from historical sources, handwriting, old Cherokee printing, and things like that. Um, I had grown up seeing the syllabary, but I didn't have a clear idea yet of the ideal forms for each character, typographically speaking. Um, Around that time, though, Mark Jamra released Phorius, which was one of the first sort of uh, modern Cherokee fonts that I had seen. Um, I studied it really carefully. I watched his Type at Cooper talk about the process that went into it. um, And that was all super helpful. And then I got to work. So these were the first Cherokee characters I drew back in 2014 or 15. Just a simple reverse contrast OCO, which means hello in Cherokee. Um, I started just drawing characters in different styles, trying to get familiar with the forms, see what I could do with them. These are just some things that I drew over the years. Eventually, I started taking language classes through the Cherokee Nation. And uh, that was when things really clicked for me personally, as far as connecting to culture and language, and also with the syllabary. Uh, Seeing my teacher, this this was my teacher, Ed Fields, from the Cherokee Nation, uh, seeing my teacher write the syllabary, connecting it to the sounds of the language in a meaningful way. Um, I started to dig in more. I read more books about Sequoia and the syllabary, took more trips to Tahlequah, which is the Cherokee Nation capital about an hour away, to the museums and the cultural centers there. And then uh, in 2021, I finally got the opportunity to do something I'd been wanting to do for a decade, which was to attend a real type program uh, when I was accepted to Type West in its first fully virtual year. I took the opportunity to design a type family that supports Cherokee, and my teachers were amazing in allowing me the freedom to do that. And uh, Grendel even introduced me to Mark Jamra, who gave me some very helpful feedback. Uh, It was very kind to do so. So here's my Type West project. I named it Maylee. Uh, My daughter's name is Mary, and in Cherokee that's pronounced Maylee. It is a typeface 
family that's uh, designed for children's books. And, you know, whatever else, but children's books were my inspiration. Uh, it's got three styles that include both Latin, Latin and Cherokee. There's a kind of a fun uh, display style, like a faux italic sort of display style. There's a textile and a text italic. This is where my character set was when I, uh, oh, I'm sorry. This was where my character set was when TypeWest finished for my display style. Actually still working on this, trying to fill out the rest of the Cherokee characters, but I've got a lot of other projects going on too. So it takes, it takes a backseat sometimes. Um, there was where the Cherokee was at the end of the, of the third term of TypeWest. These are just some ways that I envision it being used in children's books, maybe for language learning purposes, I think would be awesome. Some more examples. Uh, since then, I've been able to connect with Roy Boney and Jeff Edwards and others from the Cherokee Language Program and get some feedback as them from them, as well as find out what the typographic needs of our language community are. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, okay. So now that we're pretty far into the talk already, let me tell you what the syllabary actually is and where it came from. So I'll give a brief history here, but if you wanna hear a really thorough talk from people who are well-versed and have played their own roles in bringing the syllabary to new technologies, um, I encourage you to look up Roy Boney and Jeff Edwards' talk uh, from Talking Leaves to Pixels, which they've given several times. And I know there are at least a few videos of that on the internet. Um, but here's a brief overview from me. Cherokee people's original homelands were in the area of what is today North Carolina, Georgia, Tennessee, Alabama. Um, under President Andrew Jackson, Congress passed the Indian Removal Act in 1830. And beginning in 1838, approximately 16,000 Cherokees were rounded up and forcibly removed more than 2,000 miles west to Indian Territory in what is now Eastern Oklahoma. Up to 4,000 died because of sickness and harsh conditions. And then uh, once here, the Cherokee reestablished its government. Our language is endangered today, like all native languages. It was banned at different points. Uh, the US tried to strip native people of their culture and language through forced assimilation and boarding schools, et cetera. There are somewhere around 2,000 fluent Cherokee speakers today. And uh, we've lost more than 30 due to COVID alone. I know it's probably more than that at this point. Uh, our current principal chief is very dedicated to language preservation and revitalization. And at the end of last year, the nation opened a brand new language center in Tahlequah, which houses all of its language programs, including the immersion school, the translation department, and things like that. Um, I should also point out really quick that um, there are three federally recognized Cherokee tribes. There's the Cherokee Nation, there's the United Katua Band, both in Tahlequah, and there's the Eastern Band. Um, in North Carolina. I'm speaking from a Cherokee Nation perspective because that's my nation, but we all use the syllabary. So not trying to speak to the exclusion of anyone else, just uh, I'm a citizen of the Cherokee Nation, so that's my perspective. So uh, speaking of the syllabary, this is Sequoia, the inventor of the Cherokee syllabary. Um, he was a blacksmith, a silversmith, an artist, a statesman. He had almost certainly seen written language because of proximity to colonists and trading with them and things like that. And he might have known some English too, but he refused to ever speak it. Uh, uh, as one story goes, one day, Sequoia overheard a group of young people talking in amazement about how white men could, quote, put talk on paper. He interjected and said, you all are fools. Why, the thing is very easy. I can do it myself. And he picked up a flat stone and scratched on it with a pen. And after a few minutes, read to them a sentence that he wrote by making a mark for each word. That was the end of the conversation, but it awakened an obsessive drive in Sequoia to um, devise a system of written language for his own people. He started work on it somewhere around 1809 and worked for a decade trying out different systems. And he became a little bit of a hermit 
people didn't understand what he was trying to do. Um, so in trying to find the best way to represent the Cherokee language, he first tried making a symbol for each sentence. And when that proved unsuccessful, he tried making one for each word, but that too didn't work. So to illustrate why this would be so difficult, take this example. One word in Cherokee can be an entire sentence where each syllable holds meaning. This is how you say goodbye in Cherokee. Uh, and just changing one sound changes its meaning. So up at the top there, you see do dada gohani, which means let us two or more meet each other again. And then uh, below that, you see do na da gohani, which uh, means let us, you and I, meet each other again. Um, so yeah, you can see why it would be difficult to have a symbol for each word in Cherokee. So he tried a lot of different things. He tried sentences, words, pictographs, but eventually he broke down the sounds of the Cherokee language into 86 distinct syllables. And then he drew a symbol for each. His original designs actually looked like this, very intricate and calligraphic. And these were the designs that Cherokee people learned originally. Once he developed these designs, he started sharing them with neighbors and family members who were all able to learn them quickly but the tribe as a whole was suspicious. And at one point, uh, Sequoia and his daughter, Ayoka, were charged with witchcraft and brought before their town chief for trial. They were separated and made to write notes back and forth in the syllabary to prove its validity. Um, and when they did so, the judges were convinced. And in 1821, Sequoia formally introduced his invention. And this is the really cool part. Within a year, 90% of Cherokee people could read and write the syllabary. Um, and uh, in 1825, the Cherokee Nation formally adopted it as its official writing system. So this is where these, these guys come in. The guy on the left is Samuel Wooster. He was a missionary who lived for a long time with the Cherokee people. He was a staunch supporter of tribal sovereignty. He protested the tribe's removal to Indian territory, and importantly, as a person with printing experience, he was instrumental in working with the tribe to establish a press. So in 1826, the Cherokee National Council voted to appropriate funds to build a printing office, uh, purchase a printing press, and cast a set of Cherokee type. Wooster secured additional funding from his missionary organization and used his printing experience to help with all the logistics of getting the typecast and things like that. Uh, the guy on the right is Elias Boudinot. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, he was a Cherokee man who was selected in 1828 by the General Council of the Cherokee Nation to be the editor of a newspaper that was to be published. And that same year, uh, the two of them worked together to print the Cherokee Phoenix, which was the first newspaper published by Native Americans in the United States and the first published in a Native American language. So uh, for a long time, it was printed in English and Cherokee, and uh, it was really unique. So the move to metal type presented some challenges as it would have been nearly impossible to cut the intricate shapes that Sequoia originally designed at such a small size. Now, uh, stories differ here about who exactly played the biggest role in this transition. So I'll just give one version that I've read. Um, Sequoia went about simplifying his designs, in some cases, borrowing some forms from an English Bible that he came across at his brother-in-law's house. Uh, or at least the characters that he thought bore enough resemblance to his original designs. And for the rest of the glyphs, he created new forms. Whatever the case, I know the foundry, I can't remember the name of the foundry that cast the type in Boston, did substitute in some Latin characters here and there. Um, and I've learned recently, uh, even some characters from other scripts that they had on hand, probably at least uh, Cyrillic, Greek, and German. Um, Surprisingly, this did not cause readers of Cherokee to be unable to read it, and the metal type forms quickly became the standard form of Cherokee in both handwriting and print. Um, today, this is what people recognize uh, as the syllabary. So this chart is a little bit difficult to read. Um, but basically, this is, I believe this is Samuel Wooster's uh, arrangement of the characters which is a little bit different from the way the Sequoia arranged them, um, but it's more intuitive for 
people whose first language is English to understand. So up at the top row, you have all the vowel sounds, a, a, e, o, u, a. And then with each row below that, you add a, a consonant to the beginning of a vowel. So the next row down, you have ga, ka, ge, gi, go, gu, ga. And then ha, he, he, ho, hu, ha, and so on. This was actually how Sequoia arranged his own syllabary. Um, and I'm sure there is internal logic to it that made sense to Cherokee people, especially considering how uh, how quickly the literacy rate skyrocketed when he introduced it. So it must have made some sort of internal sense. Um, and actually, this is a good way uh, to see how his original designs became the typographic designs. Um, I believe Roy Boney put this together and you can see the, the calligraphic sort of shapes in a square with their updated designs. Some of these, it, it's really clear how they became these simplified designs here or here or even here. Uh, some of them are a little less clear. I'm not really sure how that became uh, something that looks like a Latin R or how this became something that looks like a Latin Z. Um, but I know there was a lot of back and forth between the foundry and the tribe at the time. Um, and they worked together to, to come up with the typographic solution. So uh, backtracking a little bit. So the Cherokee Phoenix, the newspaper, operated until 1834 uh, when its offices closed because of the Indian Removal Act. And after removal, a new press was established. And in 1844, the Cherokee Advocate began publication. And I got to see this page of uh, the Advocate at the Cherokee Supreme Court Museum in 2021, which was um, uh, 2021 was the bicentennial of the syllabary. So they had a lot of things going on in the museums, Tahlequah. Um, the Advocate ran for 62 years and was shut down twice during that run. It ceased publication in 1906 when the U.S. dismantled the Cherokee Nation government. Uh, all that remains are the press and some of the metal type, which I also got to see at the museum in 2021, which is very exciting for me. Um, I stood there and looked with a little magnifier at these tiny little metal types for a long time. And I think the person uh, in the office there was a little bit confused why I was spending so much time looking at it, but it was very exciting to me to see. Um, this was also in the museum. This is a masthead from the Cherokee Advocate, which was really cool. And here's a press plate from around 1905, which might have been um, from the same typeset. Uh, here are some other early printed samples from the Park Hill Mission Press that are uh, in one of the museums in Tahlequah. Okay, I'm going to go into a quick show and tell mode for a minute. I just want to give a sense of how important um, Sequoia and Syllabary are to Cherokee people by giving you a look around Tahlequah. Uh, so this is uh, one of the first things you see coming into Tahlequah, you can already see that Sequoia is kind of a larger than life figure. Uh, and the syllabary is a, a huge point of pride for Cherokee people. Um, I actually think that that up there at the top just says Cherokee mercantile or something along those lines. Um, I'm not fluent in Cherokee and I don't pronounce words super well, <laughs> but I'm working on it. I'm hoping to get there someday. Uh, here's some more pictures of signage around Tahlequah with lots of syllabary on it. Some more signage. Uh, here are a few slides showing the syllabary's adaptation to different technologies. So here's a Cherokee syllabary IBM Selectric typewriter element. 
Here's the uh, keyboard on a Hermes brand Cherokee typewriter, which I would really like to get my hands on somehow. Um, then we get a little bit more into the modern type design. Um, there have not, there, as I've already talked about, there's not been a lot of modern Cherokee typefaces made. Apparently, uh, Herman Zopf designed one in the 70s, but I can't find any evidence of it aside from this sketch. And I don't know if it was ever actually completed, to be honest, but this was cool to see. And this is something I found completely by chance. This was apparently designed for VGC's photo typositor. And it's really fascinating to me because I've never seen any other phototype era Cherokee type. This is obviously not a great design. Apologies to whoever designed it. There's a lot of, a lot of weird, funky stuff going on there. Um, I just randomly happened across that in a scan of an old uh, issue of UNLC, and I can't find any evidence of it anywhere else. But it's sort of a cool like, little missing link to find. OK. There's some history. Now I want to talk a little bit about how I approach drawing the syllabary and some of the considerations that I have to make. Um, so first, skeletons. So several years ago, uh, Roy Boney, who I've talked about a lot already, and another Cherokee artist, Joseph Erb, um, surveyed the language community to find out which elements of the glyphs were essential to their legibility. And they came up with these basic forms. I think this is really important for anyone who's designing Cherokee type to be aware of, because for instance, um, a lot of the things that people who design Latin type might be tempted to view as serifs and therefore potentially disposable are actually important for legibility. So when I'm thinking about designing in different styles, particularly sans serif styles, I need to keep in mind that these are not serifs um, and they need to be treated as uh, part of the form. So if you have the skeleton, you can dress it up any way you want, and it'll still be recognizable as long as you stay true to the skeleton. Second, uh, modularity. I'm a big believer in the modularity of type systems in general. Um, in the Latin alphabet, once you know how the straight stems look and how the round segments look and how the two join together, most of the work is done. So. Starting with control characters like capital H, capital O and H, lowercase n and O, you can then reuse parts of those characters to make other characters. So the N gives you HMU, the O and H give you BDPQ, and so on. Reusing helps with design consistency. The same is true for some, but not all other writing systems. Um, and I found Cherokee to be one of those, not just within itself, but also because of the way the syllabary was redesigned for print, as I've talked about. Um, it also shares a lot of DNA of the Latin alphabet. So for instance, uh, a lot of resizing needs to be done, but you can use like a lowercase o and an uppercase o and an uppercase t and make the Cherokee letter o. Or as I did here, I used pieces of the capital O and uh, the bowl of the p to make ooh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I don't wanna to lean too heavily on that though, because I wanna be careful not to Latinize the design and make sure that the uh, sylvia characters have um, their own internal logic, if that makes sense. Uh, not based on, not based entirely on the Latin script. That being said, um, if you're getting started drawing a, a syllabary character set and you have Latin, uh, it is, it's helpful. So looking at the 85 current characters, several of them are basically just Latin characters. So if you've already drawn your Latin alphabet, you can pretty much reuse these and you're about a quarter of the way there. Um, several more resemble Latin characters, flipped or reversed or altered in some way. And uh, several more are made out of pieces of Latin characters. Most of the remaining characters can be constructed using pieces of all of those other characters. Um, also, as I mentioned earlier, some of these characters were borrowed from other scripts besides Latin. So I'm, I'm in uh, Cherokee and Latin 
bubble and have always thought of these as Cherokee shapes. But the more I work and type and have exposure to other scripts, the more I start to realize where some of these characters may have originated. Um, I asked Roy Boney about this recently, and he said the Boston Foundry that cast the type uh, did borrow some shapes from Greek, Cyrillic, and German typesets. So these are a few of the characters that I think may have been borrowed and or adapted. There may be others too that I'm not seeing, I'm not sure. Um, but knowing this, I can look for clues and other typefaces that include these languages to get ideas for how to draw these characters in different styles. Um, because Cherokee doesn't have a lot of models to work off of um, outside of like an old style sort of serif or a uh, sans serif style. So if I'm trying to do any other style of type, I don't really have a model to work from. Um, but I can look at other scripts and that can kind of be helpful as a starting point for some of these characters that may have been borrowed from other scripts. Again, though, I don't want to lean too heavily on this because in the same way that I want to try to avoid Latinizing the syllabary uh, or basically making assumptions about drawing the syllabary as I, as I, the same ones that I make with drawing Latin, um, I don't want to like Cyrillicize or Greekize the syllabary either because the syllabary is its own thing. Um, so I, I usually lean more heavily on things I've already mentioned, like skeletons and modularity, um, and looking at handwriting, uh, cherokee handwriting samples and things like that. One final thing to note, uh, is spacing. So, um, Cherokee characters have a lot of little pieces that kind of stick off to the side in different proportions, and, uh, they need a little bit more space than... Latin characters. So that's just one more thing to think about when you're drawing Cherokee type. Okay, so now we get to the present and we can start looking toward the future. Uh, this is the Durban Feeling Language Center, which I already mentioned. Uh, it, to me, really is the epicenter of all the most exciting things happening with the Cherokee language and the syllabary, uh, at least as far as Cherokee Nation is concerned. Um, Durban Feeling uh, has been called the single largest contributor to the Cherokee language since Sequoia. He was a Cherokee linguist, linguist who wrote dozens of books and research articles, uh, developed tons of Cherokee language teaching materials, and he also compiled the Cherokee Dictionary and took the first steps toward bringing Cherokee into the modern world by making it available on word processors and smartphones. Um, so that's why this was named after him, the Durban Feeling Language Center. Today, the Language Center houses the Language Immersion School, the Adult Master Apprentice Program, the tribe's team of translators, all the different branches of the language program. Um, I've had the pleasure of visiting a couple of times, and uh, it is all Cherokee everywhere on all the signage. When I, I went to the grand opening of it at the end of last year, and I overheard someone say that Cherokee is a, or English is a second language here. So here's some examples of uh, signage outside. There's a cool little stencil, which uh, I asked Jeff Edwards if someone made that, and he wasn't, I don't think he was sure where it came from. Or maybe you misunderstood my question, but uh, that's the first like Cherokee stencil thing I've seen, which is really cool. And then there's some si some uh, door signage down there in the lower left, and then uh, the wayfinding system for the building over on the right. Here's another um, example, a very recent example of some new Cherokee type by a friend of mine, Monique Ortman. Um, this is a typeface she designed a, uh, for a thesis called Kamama, and uh, it is based on uh, Cherokee uh, weaving patterns. And you can see over there on the right that she's actually woven some of the characters too. And I think she said she wants to weave all of them, all 86. So that's going to take a long time, but I'm excited to see it. Um, one of the things that I've had the pleasure to work on over the last year is so uh, Jeff Edwards sent me a handwriting sample from a, a Cherokee speaker in the nation's language department. 
and uh, we turned that into a font. So here is the handwriting font that we made out of it. Uh, it was tricky because this handwriting is, is very unique. Uh, there are, it presented some spacing issues, but here's where I, I've ended up with it in text. And I think it works pretty well so far. Um, it's really cool to see like this, and they're really excited to see it. Um, and recently, when I, the last time I talked to Jeff and Roy, I learned that this isn't just um, his own idiosyncratic way of writing these characters. He actually learned this from his grandmother. And um, this was the way that women in that community wrote syllabary. So um, I learned this when I was in the last stages of finishing the font. And um, it just makes it's it makes it all even cooler because uh, this is preserving a part of that culture uh, that hasn't been preserved, at least to my knowledge. And it's uh, in a digital form now and you can type with it. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, something else that I'm working on is this typeface, which I've used all throughout this presentation. This is my uh, planned first release for my foundry. And um, my goal was to kind of draw it in my style, um, friendly and kind of lively looking. And nothing like that really exists. And I think that's something that is really needed. And uh, Jeff and Roy talked to me a lot about how important it is for uh, the younger generation to have typefaces that are that appeal to them also. Um, mostly when I'm going into designing a Cherokee, uh, designing Cherokee type, uh, I really want to be respectful of how the elders will view it and not try to do any, not try to stray too far from what they're familiar with or what they find appropriate. Um, but as I said, it's also important to make sure that younger generations uh, have things that they like also. So uh, this is this is a focus of mine. This is something I'm working on. Uh, it's in Latin and Cherokee so far. I'll probably add some further language support at some point. And it's in multiple weights. It's going to be variable. There's no variable Cherokee fonts at the moment. Another project that I'm really excited about that I just started on um, is uh, the Foundry Tipotech uh, has asked me to design uh, the Cherokee syllabary for a couple of their type families. I don't have much to show because I just got started on this. This is uh, the November type family. Um, which is a sans serif type family. And then there's another type family called Lava that's a serif type family that I will be drawing um, and working on a, a true italic for that one. Um, something that Jeff and Roy um, and others have mentioned to me is that we really need more support for the Cherokee lowercase, which uh, exists in just a couple of fonts, but really needs uh, more support. And so that's something that I plan to put into these typefaces and really any project that I work on. Um, and then finally, I don't have anything to show for this yet either, but um, I'm also working with the Cherokee Nation. Uh, this is a, a, a new uh, thing that we've just started talking about. Excuse me, they want me to draw a few fonts for them for different purposes. And one of the things that we talked about is uh, signage, which is something that we as uh, English speaking people take for granted, where we have and we have um, highway signage fonts like Highway Gothic, for instance. Um, and so uh, one of the things I want to work on for the Cherokee Nation is something like that, like a Cherokee Highway Gothic, basically, that can be used for road signs. Um, 
And then there are a lot of other things, a lot of other projects that we talked about, which I cannot put slides up here for because I haven't done them yet, but uh, we've had a lot of exciting conversations and there's a lot of exciting things happening. Um, finally, uh, just some thoughts about what I think is lacking in Cherokee type presently. So um, it's my belief that we need as many different styles of syllabary typefaces as possible. Type is expressive and language is expressive. And the Cherokee language in particular is a descriptive and expressive language. Um, sorry. The character of the type we use should match the content it's displaying. So can you imagine, for instance, something like the Playmobil logo set in Garamond or just something like that? Likewise, why would you say Merry Christmas in Cherokee like this when you could say it like this? So that's one of my primary goals as a type signer is to help expand that range. Um, for much of my life, I was searching for a way into culture and for a role to play. And this is a way I can give back to my people, be useful, and hopefully help play some small role in the preservation of our language. Um, and finally, just to wrap up, um, to return to the personal aspect that I started out with, uh, the reason that this work is so important to me is because um, I may not ever be entirely fluent in the Cherokee language. Uh, I'll try my best, but I want to be as fluent in Cherokee design and Cherokee type design as I am in Latin type design. So on a personal level, that's something that I'm really striving for. I want to, I want it to be second nature to me, drawing Cherokee type. Um, and also, I want to pass it along to my daughter. She's very excited about it. Um, I couldn't find the pictures in time, but she made a little, as Grendel mentioned, she made a little presentation with some poster boards for her second grade class at the end of last year, where she wrote out some syllabary characters uh, and translated them from Cherokee into English and She's really excited about it too. And that's something that I really want to pass on to her. Um, and I'm glad that she's picking up on it. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to say that um, if you're a native designer who has any sort of interest in type, I really encourage you to get into it. We need more native type designers. Um, something that, something else that uh, a few of us are working on is trying to get some materials together to uh, help facilitate uh, other Cherokee citizens to get into type design also. Um, so that's what I've got for you. Um, Wado, thank you so much for listening. Thank you for being here today. I think I came in right about at 50 minutes, which is what I was supposed to do. So um, I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Letterform Archive, uh, Grendel and Skella for having me. Um, yeah, I appreciate it. Guado, thank you to you too. That was fantastic. Chris, I'm blown away. You're going to do street signs. <laughs> Damn. We have a bunch of questions in the Q&A, so I'm going to start... Uh, waste no time getting to them and I'm going to try to type them in as as we ask them and answer them so um forgive my uh delays and also people upvote uh questions that you'd like to see answered in case we run out of time but I think I think we have it okay let's see Brandon asks is there a reference with the ductus for each Cherokee glyph in other words, the sequence and direction of the strokes when it's written. Um, for handwriting, I'm guessing. I think so. The, yeah, for like calligraphy, we talk about the ductus, yeah. maybe, that how it's written, how the glyphs are put together. There are some on the Cherokee Nation's website. Um, they've made some reference materials that talk about uh, like stroke order and things like that when you're drawing when you're writing uh, the syllabary. Um, so yeah, that can be, 
there are some references out there for that. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, Cherokee Nation website. Um, Marcia Watt asks, does Cherokee have upper and lower case letters? Yes. Um, as, as I said, it's not very well supported. Um, it just became supported by Unicode. Oh gosh, I can't remember now. It's been within the last 10 years, I believe. Um, so yeah, there's not a lot of support for it out there. I think Google's Noto has lowercase. And I know Mark Jammer's Forius has lowercase. Um, and I plan to put lowercase in whatever I, I make. But um, at the moment, that's about it. And, and they're kind of just um, like Cherokee small caps, more or less. But something we're talking about is trying to kind of differentiate some of the some of the characters uh, to like make a true lowercase, maybe. We'll see. <laughs> so you're saying that up until now, the um, the lowercase has basically been kind of like small caps, but you're thinking of expanding that. Yeah, which I don't know. I think a couple of people have kind of made some some attempts at that before. But again, it just hasn't been uh, supported widely enough to, to really get any traction. Okay, um, T. Carter Ross asks, Sequoia also developed a numeral system for Cherokee, but it didn't gain the same sort of acceptance as the syllabary. Are you familiar with those? And is there any chance of developing a typeface that includes them? Um, I didn't think about that. Um, I have seen the numerals, and I know there are some people uh, in the language program who have figured out how the system works. Um, but I'm not sure how that would work on a keyboard. With, there'd have to be a specific keyboard for it. Is but it is it a, ba a different base or something? I mean, is it what is the the complication? Um, I, I don't know how the system works, <laughs> okay. Insta, but it's, I don't think it's like a, I don't think there's like a glyph for one, a glyph for two, a glyph for three and so on. Right. No, I think it's its own numbering system. So that would, that would pose some challenges for a keyboard, but that would be cool. We're, uh, one of the things we're talking about with the Cherokee Nation is, uh, Roy Boney had done a tracing of all of, uh, of Sequoia's original designs. And he's used those in a few places. Oh, I forgot to put that in my slideshow too. There's a wall at the at the Durham Field and Language Center with uh, his tracings of the original syllabary that are that is a, like a wall wrap. That's really cool. Um, but anyway, we're talking about turning that into a usable font, also. Hmm. Okay. Well, I am absolutely. I'm totally fascinated now. I want to learn about the the number <laughs> system. In Cherokee, that is uh, that sounds amazing, and definitely look into it. Wow. Okay, um, Bader Nassau, and I apologize if I didn't say your name correctly. Bader asks if there is there a cursive form of the syllabary. Uh, no, um, not exactly. I guess I would cons maybe consider handwriting the closest you could get to that. Is, is the handwriting thing. really uh, is it differentiated from the syllabary or is it? Not exactly. So there was that one um, example. Let me get back here. Um, this is obviously differentiated <laughs> from a. Yeah. From the syllabary characters, but I mean, from the typographic characters, but yeah, I guess I would say this is the closest you could get to some kind of a, a cursive of sorts. Um, I know Mark Jamra's Forius includes what he calls a cursive italic, um, which is really nice and really cool because there's no other, there's no other Cherokee italic anywhere. Um, but I'm working on, I'm working on italic too for the Tiba Tech project, and I'm looking back at handwriting uh, and things like that for inspiration to kind of come up with what those forms should look like. Awesome. Okay. Uh, 
Oh, Bonner asked another question. Have you or anyone considered using the original Sequoia script as inspiration or perhaps revitalizing it? Yeah, so that's what I was mentioning a minute ago when someone was asking about numbers. So I think I think we are going to be making a usable font out of the original designs, uh, which Roy Boney has traced out. We just need to make them into a usable font. Um, I don't think it would be, how does, I guess it would probably be like maybe more of an op, a novelty sort of thing because people are familiar with the updated forms and that's how, that's how we, we read them and how we write them. And they're but, very yeah. different from the updated forms, right? I mean, it yeah. would be illegible to a, a reader who was used to the contemporary form. Yeah, it would be pretty difficult. Yeah. Okay. All right, let's see. Thank you. Um, Benham asks, has anyone, including you, tried a design that's not based on Latin script, like starting with the special curves of the script and then building the Latin originated shape in a new way? Um, I don't know for sure if that's been done. Um, I think that would be an interesting way to try it. I do I do start typefaces with the Cherokee sometimes, but um, you know, because of the way it was developed for type and actually some Latin characters were reused, there's sort of an inherent Latinness to the modern forms of the Cherokee characters. But that is an interesting idea to kind of base the Latin more off of the Cherokee, I guess. Totally. Okay. Um, Bert. Hey, Bert. Bert asks, in some languages, people use ASCII characters as substitute glyphs when texting, such as a three or a seven um, for, um, sorry, my Arabic's really rusty, for a couple Arabic glyphs. Uh, is there any equivalent behavior amongst Cherokee texters? If so, would you personally integrate those influences if you were to design a tech hacker sci-fi style font? Or would you rather not Latinize things at all? Great question, Bert. Um, I don't know of anything like that. There could be. Um, I'm not a fluent speaker, so I couldn't speak to that personally. Um, there is a Cherokee keyboard for iOS and for Android and for every other um, device. So um, usually when Cherokee people are texting, they'll use the, the Cherokee keyboard. But uh, yeah, that's an interesting idea. OK, Cherokee keyboard. So it's an adaptation of the QWERTY keyboard for Cherokee, or is it a separate keyboard? It's a separate keyboard that you have to, um, well, I could show it to you. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you can see that down at the bottom of my. Oh, yeah, totally. Oh, my. Okay, that's cool. Awesome. Um, and I'm just curious, then, the, you know, how we have QWERTY on the uh, typewriter keyboard and, you know, the Edwin Sherdlu on the Linotype keyboard. What's the logic for the order on the Cherokee keyboard? Uh, I'm not really an expert with it. There is some logic to it. I, I know some of them. Uh, some of them have the vowels showing, and then if you hold down on the vowel, it pops up and brings the uh, that vowel sound with consonants attached to the front of it up. I don't know if that makes any sense. 
It totally but. does. Totally <laughs> does. Yeah. Um, okay. Great question. Let's see. Haran asks, the Cherokee language is so fortunate to have its own script. How to encourage other native tribes to shed the Latin script and develop their own? That's a good question. I don't know. Um, Maybe leading by example, right? Yeah. yeah. There are some others. Um, I know in our area, there's the Osage Nation has its own its own script, um, which I believe is a newer thing. So uh, things like that are still being done and uh, created. Okay, I see a couple questions going into the chat. People, please drop those in the Q and A, um, so I can uh, relate them to uh, to Chris. Thank you. Okay, I'm sorry to interrupt, Chris. Did you um, wrap that? The Osage Nation has its own script as well. You said. Yeah, and then I know. Um, I know there are others that are. <laughs> are there any native Osage type designers out there? They need to. Uh, there, um, yeah, uh, there is one. Uh, Dr. Jessica Harjo has made an Osage typeface. So. Awesome. Okay, David Jones says, "How any ideas um, for how type designers working in Latin can contribute or teach type design?" Um. Yeah, I mean, I think. I think that's a a good thing to think about is um, how I, I guess just like diversifying who our uh, uh, students are who are learning type design, trying to get more native type students involved. Um, other ways to contribute, I guess maybe uh, work with native type designers, uh, maybe mentoring, maybe, um, you know, contracting with them to help with your, <laughs> with your. Pay them, yes, <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, there are a lot of ways. Yeah. Mentor and hire them. Okay. Uh, Leo, hey Leo, Leo asks, where can I take a course on Cherokee syllabary design? <laughs> hey, Leah. Um, so like I said, that's something that we're kind of working on in a roundabout way, not a course, but like uh, this is a, a project that uh, Monique Ortman is spearheading that I don't know if I'm actually supposed to talk about, but it's a... <laughs> It, there will be some an education element involved in it. But yeah, that is something that needs to uh, to be more out there. Maybe I can help with that too. Great idea. Stephen Coles says, love that you're building resources for future Cherokee type designers. Can you talk more about this project and what form it will take and how can we help? Okay, good follow-up question there. I don't know if I can talk more about it. <laughs> I think uh, I think Monique would be more ready to answer those questions than I am. But well, let us know how we can help. How about that? Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll definitely keep you all updated. Okay. Okay. Uh, Jacob asks. First says, amazing talk, Chris, thank you. I was curious about the punctuation of the syllabary. In the handwritten example, it looked like at the ends of sentences, there were hollow circles and symbols similar to question marks. Okay, so that, you've got a good eye, you caught that really quickly. Um, <laughs> that was just my own interpretation here because I'm working from, uh, to make this font, I was working from just this one handwriting sample of only the syllabary characters. Um, but uh, Roy and Jeff wanted to have me put some punctuation in there too. So I was just kind of working from, from the speaker's handwriting to kind of 
figure out what punctuation might look like. So yeah, since he had used a, a hollow circle for a dot on a character and for some other little elements, I thought maybe I could translate that into a period um, and then a question mark, et cetera. But uh, in writing, Cherokee just uses the same punctuation that we use in, uh, in Latin. Okay. Okay. That was the question. Um, okay. Well, just like with the numerals, maybe it's time to think about some punctuation too, huh? Yeah, that'd be yeah. cool. Yeah. yeah, right. Um, Paul says, how would someone acquire some of your Salagi? Did I pronounce that right? Salagi fonts for personal uh, yeah. use. Chalagi. Chalagi. Uh, Chalagi. Uh, the one I'm working on right now, I'm I'm really, really close to finishing and I'm gonna hoping to launch my boundary in a few months. So that'll be out there for licensing when that's ready. Um and otherwise, uh the things I'm working on for the Cherokee Nation, I think they will put out on their website when they're done. Okay. And then I'll, I have other prompts in the works too, which I will also release at some point. <laughs> okay, Harant says, is the handwriting legible to people who are used to the printed script? If so, could it serve to pull Cherokee further away from Latin? By the handwriting, um, do we mean the original, uh, glyphs or the handwriting that turned into a font, I wonder. Yeah, because if we're talking about this specific handwriting, I would oh, say- Oh, he says, he says the new stuff, yeah. Okay, I would say that this is probably legible to the, as I said, the community that's familiar with the style of handwriting. Um, more normal, or I won't say normal, the Cherokee handwriting that I usually see is a lot more uh, simplified than this and like monolinear. This has this kind of double barred style, which is not uh, not usually what you see in Cherokee handwriting. Yeah, that's kind of interesting, the double barred style, huh? That's, that's yeah. yeah. But usually it looks it looks something like what's the typographic style, just kind of handwritten, if that helps. Yeah. Nancy uh, Levitt asks, is there a Cherokee dictionary? Uh, yes, there is. Uh, Durban Feeling put together a Cherokee dictionary. Okay, okay. Michael uh, answered that. Michael also says, is there any attempt to incorporate tone markers? Yeah, so Cherokee does have um, diacritics to denote tone. Um, and oh, there's another aspect. Um, but they're actually kind of in the process of uh, going back over those and deciding what is uh, like the final state of what the diacritics will be. So, By they, you mean? Uh, uh, in, the, in the Cherokee language program, they're working on that. Um, because I'm, there's a there is a system that some people have used, but I don't think it's uh, finalized or like official. Okay, wow, interesting. That's in, in know that. the works right now. <laughs> okay, Michael uh, asks, are you working with Jeff Edwards on any graphics projects? Um, not any graphic projects, but we're working on this, on some type things together. Okay. All right. And uh, last question that I see here. Wow, we've really been burning through the, the questions. So uh, we do have a few more minutes in case we have a couple more questions. Please drop them in the Q&A. Uh, Nancy says, calligrapher Suzanne Moore, did a series of illuminated manuscript books on Sequoia and his syllabary. 
she has her students draw and calligraph the glyphs. It doesn't sound like a question, but that is uh, maybe you can talk more about that or something. I have I haven't heard of that. That sounds cool though. Is is this the same one who did the um the little red hen in in um in 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 uh, Cherokee? I'm wondering because I have that book and that is definitely you know, it's not an illuminated manuscript necessarily, but it sounds interesting. Anyways, we don't no. know, so we'll just say. Yeah, More I'm not familiar needed. with that one, sorry. <laughs> okay, and Michael says, I was just wondering about the tone because Durbin tried, but had difficulty convincing Cherokee Nation to use it. Yeah, um, as I said, it's not something that's really in use all that much but i know they're i know something they want to the word is escaping me for what not like finalize it but you know like if, make it official yeah sort of like the academy francaise or something like that of cherokee yeah yeah more or less mm -hmm. so um there is a language uh, consortium that works on these things okay 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 Were the uh, diacritics originally in um, in Sequoia's original system, or were they added later? Do you know? Uh, that would be a later edition. Okay. Yeah, I don't think. And I should be clear. I think the diacritics that I have seen, the diacritic marks, are only applied to Romanized Cherokee. So, um, you know, like Cherokee spelled out phonetically. So but, Harant, Harant follows up here. Uh, maybe this clarifies. Do the tones serve to disambiguate? If they don't, maybe that's why. Like in Arabic, short vowels can be omitted. Yes. Yeah, that is part of it. There are um, some sounds where uh, the vowel gets dropped, and that does need a marker. And I think I could be incorrect, but I think they're talking about maybe using some of these actually with syllabary characters too, to denote when a, a vowel gets dropped. Um, and that would be a helpful thing for uh, for for the students in the immersion school and things like that. Absolutely. Or yeah. for me, when I'm trying to learn. <laughs> so Joshua says, forgive me if I heard incorrectly at the beginning of the meeting, but did you say your daughter is already drawing letters? If so, do you find her drawing certain ones repetitively? I always wondered what it would be like to have having a child and influencing type design onto them. <laughs> yeah. Can I change the thing that I'm sharing on my screen? Sure. Let me see. OK, because I found one of the poster boards that she oh. made. Hmm. Okay, I'll stop that share and I will share this one instead. This is oh God, so sweet. Oh my God. Very cool. This was one of four poster boards that she made with lots of different words on them. Um, she, I think the characters that she writes the most are the ones up at the top, the May, May and Lee, those first two ones. So that's her name in Cherokee, May Lee. Oh my God. You're getting so many hearts, heart emojis <laughs> for this. It's ridiculous. Um, anyways, uh, so so how does it feel to be um, shepherding this child? <laughs> oh, on her typographic that, journey. That's the coolest thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's cool. It's so awesome that she wants to learn Cherokee, the language, and it's really, really cool that she is um, interested in drawing things too. Um, I don't know. It it makes me really happy <laughs> that she's so into it. Absolutely. Oh my God. Thank you for sharing the slide. It's heartbreaking. It's so cute. Um, 
does she uh, she writes them pretty well i don't read cherokee i can't read the syllabary so i can't tell but it seems like she's definitely not I, i'm not seeing a western influence actually in some of these lists she's just making them yeah her own. it's pretty clear i think she did yeah. a good job yeah Michael says, I belong to a Cherokee language group and there are a few other people working on typefaces, so you are not alone. Woo! Ooh, okay, that's good to know. Yay. I'm curious to know who's who's working on it. I haven't come across anybody besides yeah. uh, besides Monique, who I mentioned. Maybe Michael will hook you up after the Yeah, for sure. Okay. All right. I think that's it. Um on the questions. So I uh, just want to thank everybody for joining us today. And thank you again, Chris, so much for this great presentation. Um, it was fantastic. And a reminder, everyone, please join us next week on Tuesday, uh, March 14th at noon for Jumana Medledge's journey with Kufi. And on Thursday, March 16th for the Stephen Heller and John Sueda interview. So we hope to see you next week. Thanks again, Chris. Thank you so much, everybody. <laughs> oh, my. Yeah. Accolades are pouring in. That was a great talk. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks again for having me. You got it. And uh, really, uh, really heartwarming to see the, um, just the impact that you're having, right? The profound and actual impact on people's lives right i don't know i i hope so i hope it's yeah. <laughs> something i'm just trying to i'm i'm really excited and glad that i can use some skills that i've learned to help give back and um i don't know i just hope i can be helpful that's my, well, that's my it's, it seems like you're being pretty helpful and and useful and uh helping to keep this system from dying in this 21st century where so much uh, assimilation is still going on and so many languages and writing systems are going extinct yeah. that it seems important to prevent that. And like I said, I think we're in a pretty good place uh, as the Cherokee Nation with the, the Durban Feeling Language Center because they're really hyper-focused on all kinds of projects for language preservation and revitalization. So it's uh, it's an exciting time to be doing this kind of thing. Keep up the great work, Chris. Okay, <laughs> we better sign off now before I start crying. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everybody. And thanks again, Chris. Thank Have you all. Have a great so much afternoon. Ciao.